Hey everybody, welcome back to Jim's Garage. If you've been around the internet for a while, you've definitely heard of Pastebin. It's pretty much the first place that any data breach, that data gets posted to. So whilst that highlights some of the bizarre benefits in terms of this is a public repository where you can paste effectively anything, what if I told you that there is a self-hosted version that pretty much has all of the same features that you can spin up with a single Docker Compose? Well, that's what we're going to be doing today, courtesy of Private Bin. It's pretty much a one-for-one -one copy of Pastebin, which gives you control over how this is going to be accessed. It has all of the benefits of being end-to-end -end encrypted. That means the person hosting the server cannot see the data. It's the client that has the password to access it. It comes with things like password-protected sharing, you can have open discussions on your pastes and you get convenient links via QR codes and web URLs to be able to share this wherever you want. You'll obviously need to set up some port forwarding, etc. if you want this accessible to the internet, but if you simply want something that's locally hosted, you can do that. Now, as always, I'll be setting this up in Docker. I'll be putting this behind a reverse proxy and I'll talk through all of the configuration steps. So let's head over now to my Docker VM. Let's have a look through the configuration Let's get this up and running, and then I'll show a few examples of this working. So over on my Docker host, this is the compose file I've put together to get this up and running. So it's pretty straightforward and it uses a single official container to do this. Now the image we're using is the private bin and it's the Nginx FPM Alpine container. We're gonna restart always and we're gonna set read only to true. This isn't something I've typically done before, but it's something I saw that was recommended. What this means is it can't basically write to anything on the host that it's not supposed to. Now we set the user to be the user that the Docker host is running at. And it's important that you change this to whatever user you want to use. By default, 1000 should be okay if it's the only user you have on the machine. But if you're gonna create another user, for example, you will need to change this to their UID, GID, etc. You'll also, this volume down here, You'll need to make sure that the left hand side, which is the folder on the host, is also owned by this user. Otherwise, you're going to get some funky permission issues. You could obviously resolve that by making it say world or group writable. But to keep it simple, I recommend that you create the folder using this user here. Next up, we're skipping over the ports because I'm going to put this behind a reverse proxy. If you want to skip the reverse proxy and you want to use the ports, you can obviously put these back in and access it on your Docker IP with the ports of 8080. You can obviously change this left hand side if 8080 is already taken. Usually that's quite a common port anyway. Next up, we've got volume. So I prefer to use a bind mount as opposed to a Docker volume. I find them easier to work with. This here, as I mentioned, this folder here, this is owned by this user here. So it will have permissions to write to the directory once the container is spun up. Now, again, this part here is optional. If you are using a proxy, you will need to put it on whatever network your proxy is on. For my case, I use traffic and I put it on a network called proxy. That network has been previously created when I created the traffic container. The labels are pretty straightforward if you've watched any of my videos. All we're doing here really is having an entry point for HTTP, which automatically gets redirected to the HTTPS. You could do this via a static configuration and just have that in the background, but I like to leave it in here just so you can see exactly what's going on. As you can see, I've created a DNS entry here. So this is the URL it expects to be served upon. So you will need to take whatever this is here and put it into your domain name resolver. For me, I use Pi-hole, but you may be using things like AdGuard, your firewall, or even something like a hosts file. If you're putting this on the internet, internet facing, you're gonna obviously need to make sure that this record is replicated and it points to your external WAN IP. Once we've got that, pretty much all we need to do is specify that this is being load balanced on port 8080, which if you look up here on the right hand side, the container port, that's the default port that private bin runs on. So this will be load balanced to port 8080. And the benefit of doing this is it gives us a nice friendly URL with a nice SSL certificate so that there aren't any browser complaints. And I generally recommend you do this anyway, even if you're only gonna be hosting this locally. It means that you don't have to remember awkward things like IP addresses and ports. You can have a friendly reminder like privatebin.yourdomain.com. Makes life a hell of a lot easier. Lastly, we've got the network section. And as I mentioned before, I'm sticking this on the proxy network. It's defined as external true because I created this network when I created the proxy container. Therefore, it already exists. It's external to this Docker Compose file. 
Now, there are some additional parameters you can put in here, and those are largely within the configuration file. Through my testing, I've actually found that the default setup is probably what you want. The config file really is more a case of removing some of those options if you didn't want it. For example, you may wish to turn off comments because you don't know what people are going to be putting on there. The counter argument to that would be you're letting people pay stuff on there anyway. So just for a quick glance, we can have a look through. We can allow things like name option to replace private bin title on the website. So basically customize it if you wanted to. You can specify the base path for where this is going to be served from. That isn't an issue if you're using like I am with a traffic reverse proxy. We also have things like the discussion, whether you want that to be enabled or off or defaults to true. I like to have that on so that people can leave comments if they want to. We can have a password so you can decide whether you want to have the password feature on or off. I think it's a good idea to have it on. Remember, even though you're the admin, if somebody puts a password on that, you won't have access to whatever they put on there. Lastly, we've got the file option for upload. Now this defaults to false, and you can probably think why that would be the default. This is primarily for pasting text and things in. If you want to allow it to have files, you'll need to create the config file and add that. But I think that's going off piece for what this application excels at. Lastly, we've got the burn after reading selected. It defaults to false, but you could put that to true if you wanted. That means that if somebody clicks on that link, once they've read it, that's it. It's a single use link. It will expire and automatically delete. There are some formatting options and syntax highlighting as well, which is good to see. So you can actually have it look fancy and properly pass code, a bit like I've showed just a minute ago in Visual Studio with that Docker Compose file. And there is a size limit as well so that you don't want people just spamming tons of text. And it's obviously going to be good for if you enable file uploads, you probably want to reduce or at least restrict the maximum file size so someone doesn't abuse it. There are some other handy features like having notices built into it, changing the language, having a URL shortener. That might be good if that's something you want to use. Typically, I try and stay away from URL shorteners. But if you're using maybe social media with a character limit, that could be something you wish to consider. I'm going to skip over the majority of the other ones because they're quite fine grain and granular. But please do come and have a look at this configuration file if you're really interested in running this. And certainly if you're going to be externally hosting this. So now we understand the YAML file and the configuration options. Let's boot this thing up. So I'm going to do a sudo docker compose up dash D enter my password and then hopefully it's going to pull down the images and we should be up and running pretty quickly because it's a very lightweight image. So now that that's done, hopefully if you've added this value to your DNS resolver, you should be able to copy this and then head into your browser and we should be able to access the page. So let's see that that's worked. So with that in my URL, let me hit return and bingo. Yep, there we go. Gonna have to wear the sunglasses for this one, but to be honest, we probably need some brightness. It's pretty dark nowadays. So as you can see, we've got the defaults available to us. You can see in the top that we can create a new, but by default, it's already on a new paste. We can see that the default expiry is one week. If we wanted to change that, I don't know, we've got anything from five minutes to never. So you decide whatever you want to do. You can obviously turn on that burn after reading. Now with burn after reading, once that link is clicked, it will basically delete the message. So decide whether that's something that you want. You won't be able to recover that if you've got that selected. If you refresh the browser after clicking the link, it's gone, it doesn't exist. And I'll demonstrate that in a moment. So let's leave that and let's turn on discussions. You can obviously decide if you want that. If you have discussions, it's gonna create some permanence at least up to this expiry. You can add a password so that only people with the link and the password can access that. And you can also change which format you want. So whether it's plain text, source code, or markdown. So let's just go for some plain text. I'm just gonna stick in here the Docker Compose file that we just looked at. So if I collect this, I copy it, I head back to it, and I paste it into this. You can see here now that we've got that in there. If we click preview, we'll see what it's gonna actually look like. I wonder if I can actually select that as source code and it's gonna format it nicely. But anyway, what we need to do now is hit create. Now, when we click create, it's actually created this link here. So this is basically what you need to share with people if you want them to look at it. It has actually gone and formatted it, which is really nice to see. You can also then click email and that will add a link to an email to send to you. You can actually just clone this paste and then make another one off the back of it. 
or you can generate a QR code if you click this here. So you could send that QR code, you could scan it to get the link, etc. So let me just take this link here. You can actually just left click on it and it will open it up. And here you can see the link that we had before. So this is showing the data that we had, that Docker Compose file. It's showing that the document will expire in six days and it also has some discussions. So you can obviously add a comment here and you can post that and then other people can do that as well. Now this is allowed to have anonymous on here but you can add a username as well if you wish to. So now that we've got that, we've got options of we can save it. So you can click on save paste. It'll just go away now and download that if you want to do it. And as long as you've got this URL, you're going to be absolutely fine. So I'm going to create now a new one. And this time what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that it burns after reading. So it will still last for one week. So somebody's got a week to open this. But as soon as they open it, it's going to burn. So we could even still say, hey, this is always going to be here until somebody opens it. And we can put the password in, let's just say test. And then this time, let's put in something different. So I've just stolen some text from a news article. That's now pasted in there. We've got the password selected. We've got burn after reading. Let's now create that. So now that's created and we get this link here. We can open that in a new tab. But remember, when we open this, firstly, it's going to ask us for the password. It's also going to say that the first time we see this, it's going to actually only be displayed once. So yes, let's see it. Now let's put in our password. Let's decrypt it. And then bang, we've got it. Exactly what it said before. Now, importantly, obviously, if we now refresh this, the secret message can only be displayed. We'd like to see it. But no, it's now expired. It's been deleted. And we can actually validate that if we look on the host as well, because that data now should have disappeared. And so now that has been deleted, we're safe in the knowledge that nobody else can access that data, which is pretty awesome. And again, like I say, even the host won't be able to see that. And even if they could see it, they wouldn't necessarily have the password to view it as well because it's end to end encrypted. So I hope you like that pretty quick walkthrough. Um, I think this is a great tool. It's basically a one to one clone of Pastebin, but obviously safe in the knowledge that you can host it. Now do bear in mind that obviously from a security standpoint and a probably more over a privacy standpoint, Firstly, if you're going to host this, you've got to make sure that whatever people are putting in here, there aren't any nasties, things like cross-site scripting, different types of injection attacks. And also, if you're a client, i.e. a user, and you're going to use somebody's system that's hosting this, do bear in mind that they could track your IP or whatever, so be careful what you're putting on here, for instance. Anyway, let me know what you think of this. I think it's pretty awesome. So thank you for watching everybody. Hopefully this is something that you can use in your home lab or whatever it is you're thinking of. I think it's a great tool. Let me know if it is something you're going to use. Let me know what features you'd like to see, etc. in the comments below. But as always, if you've liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please hit the subscribe and I'll see you on the next one. Take care, everybody.